Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about the science of fossil fuels and where they come from. I'm sitting here in Calgary, uh, in Alberta, so that's the big red dot on the map there. We had about 20 to 25 centimeters of snow over the last day and a half, so it's pretty snowy and cold here right now. Uh, as Alex said, I've had a very mixed career path, which is pretty typical for geology because it is a bit of a boom and bust science. So I've worked in gold mining, uh, submarine cable laying. I have a master's and a PhD. I, I've worked for a bunch of different oil companies, and uh, I'm now working in the construction industry, basically monitoring sites to make sure that fossils are not being damaged. So let's start off by thinking about uh, what people believe about oil and gas. So the belief is often that oil comes from dinosaurs and there are these giant caves below the Earth's surface that are just full of oil. You just need to drill down into them and the oil will literally gush to the surface. And people also believe that fracking, so breaking up the rocks beneath the surface, creates earthquakes and contaminates groundwater. But the reality is really quite different. So finding an oil requires a, an in-depth knowledge of geology. And oil is actually made from microscopic bugs and gas comes from plants. So there's no dinosaurs involved. Uh, heat and deep burial are essential to make hydrocarbons. And we'll look at this in more detail as we go through the talk. And getting out the oil out of the ground requires significant technology to make it happen. So why do people believe that dinosaurs are at the root of everything? Well, really it's all up to Harry Sinclair. And he was about a hundred years ago, he was uh, completely broke and he set up a company called Sinclair Oil named after himself and started selling lumber to oil derricks. And he had huge success and uh, he created his own oil company as well. And by the late 1920s, Sinclair Oil was the seventh largest oil company in the US. And he talked to his marketing men and they decided, or and women, and they decided that uh, the use of a dinosaur in their advertising would certainly help to educate customers on the origin of fossil fuels and would also put pressure on the parents by their kids to bring them in to buy more oil from his uh, his company. So by 1932, he'd registered dino, this green dinosaur up on the top right here is a, a trademark, and it's definitely become the most famous dinosaur in the world. Uh, so. As time went on, the company grew, they used dinosaurs in a lot of their advertising. And I think this is where people started believing that a lot of the oil actually came from dinosaurs themselves. And I think the highlight or the heyday of Sinclair was at the 1964 World's Fair. So this is a, a picture, this uh, upper left-hand picture is a picture of these dinosaurs that he had created and they were brought to the, the, the World Fair in Queens in New York. And it's estimated that 50 million people visited Dinoland, which is something like a, a third of the population of the United States. And then after the uh, the exhibit was finished, this animal Dino, he traveled through more than 10,000 miles through 25 states and ended up in Glen Rose in Texas. And I've actually made that pilgrimage to Glen Rose to go and see this very dinosaur that was one of the dinosaurs that was on display. So let's talk about the reality of oil and gas now and petroleum geology as well. So petroleum geology is the study of the origin, the occurrence, movement, accumulation and exploration for hydrocarbon fuels, because hydrocarbon is not just oil. It's oil, gas and condensate as well. And to make a working oil play, to have a situation where you can drill a well down into the earth and find hydrocarbons, you need four key ingredients. So these are a source rock. So that's a, an organic rich source rock that can actually generate hydrocarbons. You need a reservoir, which is basically a store, porous storage space that can hold hydrocarbons. And it needs permeability, which is the ability of fl 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 fluids to flow through the sediment as well. You need an adequate seal. So this is an impermeable cap that sits on top of your reservoir to stop all of the oil and gas escaping. And you need a trap, which is like a focus point for the oil or gas to accumulate in one spot. So this is the kind of the, the Cook's notes, the, the perfect example of what happens and things are not normally this simple. But if we look at this diagram here down on the lower left, we have the source rock. So this brown source rock here. And this is a deposit that's rich in organic matter. It might be uh, planktonic forams or it might be uh, plants that are in here. And over time, 
this, this rock will mature as it's heated and it will generate hydrocarbons. So the hydrocarbons will then be generated and they'll make their way up through this blue layer, which is a porous layer, until they reach a point where they start becoming trapped. So up here where this red cap is with the green layer underneath, this is where your hydrocarbons will accumulate. The gray layer above is the seal. So that's holding those hydrocarbons in. And this shape here, this dome-like shape is a way of trapping hydrocarbons. And we'll talk about some of the different types of traps as we go through the presentation. And the only other thing that is really important is that this all happens in the right order. If you fold your rocks after you've generated your hydrocarbons, then the hydrocarbons will just make their way out to surface. And that's quite often you do see this where you see seeps at surface, oil and gas seeps, but obviously there's no way that they can accumulate underground. So what I'm going to do is to talk about each of the four elements in a little bit more detail now. We're going to start off by talking about reservoirs. So reservoirs are a porous and permeable unit. So that's a rock unit that retains migrating hydrocarbons. And if we look at worldwide reservoirs from uh, different countries and we look at the stats, you can see that sandstones make up about 60% of all reservoirs around the world. Carbonate, so that's basically limestones, make up about 39%. And then we have 1% that's left over, which is fractured rocks that can include igneous rocks like basalt, that if they're fractured enough, then they can also hold hydrocarbons. So basically the most important rocks are sandstones and sandstones, particularly in deltaic settings and river settings and shallow marine settings, rocks that are deposited in those environments are usually the most important reservoirs. So if we look at this diagram down here, which I've entitled main depositional environments, you can see up in the mountains here, we, the, you're going to have a lot of rainfall and the rain creates rivers which make their way down across the floodplains. So these would be river deposits and then come to the sea where they form a delta or a beach. And then they spill out into the ocean, down the continental slope and then down into deep water. And basically everywhere where sand is deposited along this path, including lakes, including deserts, you can form hydrocarbon reservoirs. And limestones in shallow marine conditions can also make an excellent reservoir. So this is uh, the one equation that I have in my slides set today. And the reason is just for those of you who are interested in calculating how much oil is in a reservoir underground. So the volume of oil will be your total rock volume. So this little diagram here, it'll be this total cube sitting in here. And then you multiply that by the percentage that's reservoir. So in this case, we have a, a two kilometer rich, two kilometer high cube. And one kilometer of that holds hydrocarbons. That's a reservoir. So you'd multiply this total rock volume by 50% or by half, because only half is reservoir. Then you work out what percentage of the reservoir is actually the holes in it. So the actual pore space, and that's, a let's say, 25%. So about a quarter of this overall reservoir is actual pore space. And then you multiply that by the saturation of oil. So there's water in there as well. So in this case, we've assumed that about half of this is going to be oil and half is water. And then when you take hydrocarbons out of the ground, hydro the oil cools down, so it actually contracts. So you have to divide this by a number greater than one to allow for that contraction. So that gives us, if we do the calculation here, we've got a kilometer thick reservoir with 25% porosity a two kilometer by two kilometer area and it will hold about 2.8 billion barrels so that's and that's a pretty large oil field in the scheme of things when you produce the oil out of a reservoir you can't recover all of it there's lots of it that gets trapped in little holes and pockets and a typical recovery factor is about 30 percent so in in this case here with 30 percent that would be about a million barrels in this in this area and the current usage of oil around the world is about 100 million barrels every day, which is a, an incredible figure, really. So that this just shows this is about enough oil in there to keep the world going for one day. So reservoir properties are very important. It's all very well having a sandstone, but you need to have some other aspects that work as well. So I've already mentioned these briefly, but porosity is one. So the typical porosity in a sandstone, the void space is about 20 to 30%. If you can imagine all those little sand grains all clustered together, there's gonna to be spaces in between them. And this thin section here, this cut through a sandstone, all of the pink area here is void space or porosity. You also need to have permeability. So this is the ability for fluid to flow through the rock. 
So it's all very well having holes in it, but if the holes don't join together, then the fluid will not come out of your reservoir. So the better the porosity, the better your reservoir. And that you can see here that it's measured in Darcy's and the, the typical permeabilities can range from a very small figure to a huge figure. So you can have very easily producible reservoirs to reservoirs where you have to fracture them artificially to produce the oil or gas that they contain. There's also net to gross. So this is the, the ratio of reservoir to non-reservoir. So this is sand in here, which is a reservoir, rock. And shale, generally speaking, is not a reservoir. So that's a very fine grained rock. It doesn't have enough permeability to actually produce. So in this section here, only about a third of this, the sands themselves, would be reservoir. And then finally, I already mentioned the oil shrinkage factor. So oil shrinks by about 10% usually when it gets to surface. And gas, because it's uh, contained underground, when you release the gas, it expands to about 30 times its volume when it gets to surface. So I've talked about sandstones and limestones. So those are what we call conventional reservoirs. There are unconventional reservoirs as well, and they, they have not received that very good press over the last few years, but they are producing a huge amount of oil and gas. And I've got some examples here. This is a, a limestone deposit that uh, was a carbonate platform, so a limestone platform. And you can see that this is absolutely dripping with oil. But unfortunately, this particular reservoir does not have any permeability. So it has lots of holes in it that are full of oil, but it does not have any permeability. And then the lower example here is the, from the oil sands. So these oil sands, uh, they, they occur in Canada. Uh, there's about 1.7 trillion barrels of oil in Canada in the oil sands. They also occur in Venezuela, which actually contains the most of the, the world's oil resources. And you can see here that these rocks, these rocks here, these sandstones are heavily stained by oil. And so what happens is that this is actually bitumen, bituminous oil. So it's not really mobile. So you actually have to heat these rocks up by introducing steam before you can produce them. So next, let's look at seals and traps. There's a, a joke pun there with the, the seals, but uh, seals are actually the impervious rocks that form the barriers or the caps above and around a reservoir rock. So what if you look at this? diagram on the lower right here you can see that we have these top seals here that this is a Im imporous rock that's sitting above the reservoir that stops the oil or gas from just leaking up to surface typically the best seals are mudstone rocks or evaporites like salt or anhydrite so uh, salts what's left over if you have an ocean that just basically evaporates and it leaves a thick salt layer which will will basically it's very impervious most traps that we have most of the traps that, that hold the oil and gas uh, in one particular zone you don't just have a seal at the top but you may need a bottom seal to stop the hydrocarbons from leaking out laterally and sideways and you may even need a, a side seal as well so a lateral seal as well so you you don't necessarily need thick seals but you do need as many seals as you can around your reservoir so last of all, we come to traps. So there are various kinds of traps where your hydrocarbons can accumulate. So uh, most of most of the important ones are actually the structural traps. So these are formed by tectonic activity in the Earth's subsurface. So faulting can definitely lead to a trapping configuration. So if you look at this diagram on the upper left here, we've got a fault running down through the middle of the field here. And that fault has smear, so it has mud, mud smeared along it. So there's no, this doesn't allow any oil or gas through this fault. So you can see that the oil and the gas have been trapped up against this fault right here. So that's one type of configuration. Another type of configuration is uh, what's called a turtle back or a, a, a simple anticlinal structure where you have the, you basically bend your rocks upwards. So you can see here in this middle diagram on the left, the rocks are bent upwards and the oil has migrated up to this point, but then it's capped by this roof rock which is uh, impermeable. And so the oil is gradually accumulating. So it's actually quite easy if you see these structures at surface to think, well, this would be a good place to drill because I have a big hill sitting at surface. And then there are also other types of fault, uh, fault related plays like growth faults. And this is where this, basically this is like a landslide underwater where these rocks have slipped down and the bending of the rocks as they've slipped down has allowed oil traps to form beneath these surfaces. Another way that you can form traps is by salt activity. So there's a lot of thick salt rocks in the subsurface. And it's interesting that they, they basically behave as a very slow moving fluid. 
So as you squeeze those rocks over time, the salt will actually migrate. And because of that migration, because of the movement of salt, it tends to create great uh, reservoir traps. So you can see here that we've got different types of salt structures in black on this lower left diagram. And around them, we're getting draping of the sediment, which would allow oil to accumulate. There are also stratigraphic traps. So these traps are where you basically encase a sand in shale or a sand or a limestone in shale. So we've got some examples here where we have a, a reef, a limestone reef sitting in here, and that's encased in shales. So the oil is trapped within there and cannot escape through the shales. And then we also have some sandstones here that might be a channel, like a river channel, that's also encased in shale. So when the oil migrates into the sandstone, because the shale is all around it, then the, the oil is contained just within the sandstone reservoir. Now, generally speaking, if you look at the, the um, statistics for these types of plays and these types of traps, we can see that the dome plays, so that turtle black that I was talking about, they have the highest success rate in the North Sea of about 50%. Faulted plays, about 26%. And then as you go down through the stratigraphic plays, we're down to about 13%. So you have a much better chance of trapping your oil and gas in structural play than you do in a, in a stratigraphic play. And I've just put some other examples of the stratigraphic plays in here. So we have a, a channel running through here that's encased in mudstones. And this is a, a seismic section. So this is using sonar, si sound data that's pumped down into the subsurface. And then the reflections are measured to build up a three-dimensional picture in the subsurface. And this second diagram here is showing what a delta looks like when you see a delta in the subsurface. So the, the depth here is about three, four kilometers. And then the distance across here is about uh, 20 kilometers. And we're seeing this giant delta here where they've drilled several wells into it to produce the hydrocarbons. So we've talked about the elements that you need to make a play, but uh, you also need to make oil somehow. And uh, it's all very well having these organic rich source rocks. And this source rock here is the Exshore Shale, about uh, 100 kilometers away from where I am right now in the, the Rocky Mountains. And this source rock here is responsible for most of the oil that we see in the oil sands in Canada. So it may not look like much, it may look a bit like a coal, but this is an organic rich source rock which was can be ch changed and transmogrified into oil. So how does that process happen? Well, you need source rocks to start off with. So source rocks are rocks from which hydrocarbons have been generated or can be generated. So they are organic rich and they can, could have been deposited in a lake or usually in quite deep marine conditions. And you need three key elements. So they need to have lots of organic material in them, ideally more than 5% of organic material. And that could be plants, it could be little bugs. You need enough volume of your source rock to generate lots of oil. The bigger the area of source rock, the more oil you're going to have. And you need thermal maturity. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this source rock here and we're going to bake it up by burying it deep beneath the Earth's surface. And then that is going to help the maturity process that will convert this source rock into oil or gas. So most of the oil comes from marine source rocks, so deep marine conditions. 70% of the oil comes from the Mesozoic times, which is dinosaur times, which was very warm and fecund, very fertile conditions, and a little bit less oil, uh, oxygen, which meant that the, a lot of the oil and gas that was deposited was not actually converted into uh, oxidized by uh, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And most of the gas it says here comes from carboniferous coals. We'll talk about that in a little bit more in a moment. So what you need, you've got your, this organic material in your source rock, and that organic material is known as kerogen. So this is kerogen here. So this is bits of plant, bits of animal, pollen grains, bits of wood, and all of this material goes to make up this kerogen, which is basically just an organic mulch, which is in the subsurface. And as I said, you want to get that mulch and have enough of it that you can start maturing it, start baking it to make the hydrocarbons themselves. So typically the source for these, these um, oil producing kerogens is lakes and marine deposits. And the source for gas producing kerogens is in swamps and rivers, so terrestrial environments. So, how do you heat up these rocks enough to change them and to change that kerogen into oil and gas? Well, you basically heat them through burial. So when you heat these kerogens in the Earth's crust, 
if you heat them up to about 50 to 150 degrees C, which is not a huge amount, it's a lot less than you would be putting on in your in your oven but this evening, then that's enough to generate oil. And if you start increasing, turning up your oven and uh, burying your rocks deeper, then you'll move into the gas window. So then you start creating gas. And in fact, if you do pass through this initial, so this is a, a diagram with increasing depth and temperature here. So this is at surface where we have some methane, but as we go down deeper into the Earth's crust, we start generating the oil. So and this is the oil window here that's 50 to 150 degrees C. But if you keep on burying that oil, unfortunately you'll break down that oil and you create gas instead. So at shallower depths, we'll have wet gas and deeper depths, we'll have dry gas. So this is the, the hydrocarbons are being generated as we bury these rocks. So there's a, a variety of processes that you go through. So the initial process is diagenesis, which is usually just uh, remobilizing uh, different kinds of sediment. So you might uh, dissolve limestones and re-precipitate it as calcites, things like that. So that does not really affect the, the, the process of creating hydrocarbons. But catagenesis, that's the initial cracking process that cracks your kerogen and creates oil. So if any of you have heard of cracking, and uh, it's I think it's quite commonly known that cracking is the process by which you trans change your hydrocarbon style and break down your hydrocarbons. So this catagenic process here is basically cracking. And then as you increase that and you, and you pass into metagenesis, where you go into deeper rocks, hotter conditions, then you pass through that, that oil window and into a mixture of wet gas, which is propane, ethane, butane, and pentane, and the dry gas, which is methane. So we've got a process here that goes from kerogen, oil, and then into gas. So once you've created that oil and gas, every oil is unique. So I don't know if any of you did this at school, but uh, you, you can get a, a felt tip pen and you can break that pen open and you've got that little sort of oil bearing cylinder inside and you put that oil into water, pour it into a coffee filter and then you leave it to dry. And as it dries and as it percolates outwards, you start separating out the different parts of the ink and you find that that red pen that you were busy using is not really red ink at all. It's made up of a combination of green, red, brown and black. And this is exactly the same that we see in oil. So when you get any oil and you uh, do gas chromatography, so this is a chromatograph, but we're using a gas chromatograph, which is basically a piece of kit and a piece of equipment, then what it will do it will tell you all of the different elements of your oil. So this is basically the amount of the, the, the simple hydrocarbons are down here, the CH4s, the methanes, and then you go through the butanes, the propanes, and the oil gets heavier and heavier, heavier and more and more complicated as you go up through the scale so that you get the different proportions of the different hydrocarbons within your oil, which gives it a unique fingerprint. So I've just got two examples here on the top right, fresh oil from the Norwegian North Sea. So that's what its signature looks like. It's chromatograph signature. And then this is severely biodegraded oil. So what's happened here is that a lot of the lights, a lot of the nice light bits of the oil have been eaten by bugs and you're left with a kind of bituminous yuck. And that's what's left behind. And you can see it has a totally different signature. So there's a whole group of uh, scientists out there that are studying these different families of oil. And I've just put this example in here from the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see that the different rocks have generated different oils. So Oxfordian, Tithonian, these are different ages of sediments, and the, the hydrocarbon, the hydrocarbon generating source rocks within them have generated the different kinds of oil with different fingerprints in different parts of the Gulf of Mexico. And this can be very useful because it can help you to determine where your best source rocks are. So you can go and see a source rock on surface, like the one I showed you the picture of from close to Calgary. You can sample that source rock and then you can look at rocks in the subsurface and see if they have this same signature here, in which case they've been generated by that same source rock. You can also use it to determine the source of oil spills or find out whether they are oil spills or natural seeps. So let's say you have a tanker that's suspected of uh, discharging oil into the sea. You can collect those samples of oil and compare them to the oil in the tanker. So the last factor, as long as once you have your four key ingredients, your seal, trap, reservoir, and source rock, is that you need to time everything right. You need to make sure that you, when you generate your source rocks, that you already have a trap in place. 
that's going to allow that oil and gas to accumulate in one spot. So a, a lot of this is done but through modeling, three-dimensional modeling, and it's very intensive. But uh, the three-dimensional modeling allows the, the um, reservoir engineers to work out where the oil is going to migrate and where it's going to accumulate in the subsurface. So after that, after you've produced this model, which says there's going to be lots of oil here, lots of oil here, here, you can then drill in those spots to find the oil. So what bugs help us to accumulate oil and gas? Well, some of the oldest reservoirs date back to almost 3 billion years ago. So the oil that was in these rocks is no longer oil. It's actually been baked up completely and baked into carbon. So this is an oil deposit that was created by algae 2.9 billion years ago in South Africa. It's accumulated within this sandstone and conglomeratic, this pebbly reservoir here. And then over the next billion, billion and a half years, it's been cooked and cooked and cooked. So it's gone through the stage of being oil. It's been matured further and matured into gas. And then it's been so matured that it's actually formed pure carbon. And this is a pure carbon layer here. Now, the nice thing about carbon is it forms an amalgam with gold. So then the pore, pore waters passing through this rock that contains minute amounts of gold, the gold has been deposited on the carbon. So that layer there that I'm passing the pointer around, that sickly yellow layer is pure gold that's been deposited. So you could say that this is probably the world's richest oil field. So I worked on this gold mine when I was a young lad, about 20 years old, and this is some of the, the shafts behind me from where they were producing this oil. And the oil content can get up to probably uh, about four, four, 14 or 15 percent, and that's it's actually preserved as carbon, and then that allows the gold to accumulate up to 30 kilograms per tonne, so some incredibly high gold values. And this is what the depositional system looked like at that time, so we had these rivers flowing down from the mountains around the edge of the Vatas Run Basin and down into a shallow sea, and then these stromatolites here, these are the algae that formed the algal deposits that eventually formed oil and then carbon. Most oil, however, comes from single-celled zooplankton and algae, so diatoms. And this is just a typical picture here taken from the literature showing a variety of these organisms. So these are, it's one of those things where how many angels cover the head of a pin? There are millions of these animals will, will uh, fit into a very small area, but every one of those animals that dies has body fluids within it. They sink down to the depths of the ocean, Stagnant conditions, anoxic, so no oxygen, so they just lie there and they gradually get covered up by sediment, and so they're buried with all of these organic contents within them, and that is the carbon that then generates the oil as it gets heated. So it's these little tiny bugs here which are generating 99% of the world's oil. So this is just a slightly bigger animal, this is something like a trilobite, it's actually called Morella. And it's from the Cambrian, so about 550 million years ago. And you can actually see its body fluids here in this black balloon-like area here on, on the shale. So this is just to give you an example of one of the bigger animals and how its body fluids have literally formed an oil within this shaley rock. So that's oil. That's where oil comes from. Most gas comes from coal and specifically from the Carboniferous. So at that time, this is around 350 million years ago, there were great forests and tropical swamps, many new plant species. There were some huge insects. This, some of the biggest insects had wingspans up to 70 centimeters across. So giant, ginormous compared to any insects that we see today. And partly because there were very high oxygen conditions. So these peat deposits initially formed in the swamps up to 600 meters thick and much thicker than anything we see today. And then they would gradually be compressed to form the coal. And then as the coal was heated up, it generated gas. Now it's interesting that the Carboniferous has so many coals and the theory for why there's so many coals there and so many swamps and less swamps today is that the white rot fungus, which is hugely active since the Carboniferous, was not around at that time. So a lot of the, the coal that was deposited was not affected by fungus. The fungus did not destroy the coal. So the coal was preserved in these massive thick beds, which we really don't see anything like that today. And this is just to show some Carboniferous fossils as well. So it's not just the coals, there's some beautifully preserved material. So this is the dragonfly that I talked about earlier with the 70 centimeter wingspan. 
but there are also beautiful fossil trees here. This is from Nova Scotia. This is another one from Glasgow here with the, literally all of the, the rooting stretching out and all beautifully preserved, and then some ferns as well. And the, the mo the, most of these ones at the top here are from the UK, but there are coal reserves around the world all capable of generating gas. So a lot of the generation that went on, a lot of the source rocks were deposited in the Middle East and basically in the, the Mesozoic time. So this is dinosaur time. So from around 200 million to around 65 million years ago. And Saudi Arabia holds the world's greatest oil reserves and the best source rocks as well. And that's closely followed by Iran and Iraq. So when we look at the amount of oil and gas here, the most light oil is held by these three countries. There is a lot of oil in Venezuela and Canada, but basically it's bituminous and it's much more difficult to produce. So it's really this area where the, the, the Goldilocks environments, where everything was just right. So what we had for a very stable period, 140 million years, we, we had limestone platforms, sea level would rise and cover it with a, a shale. A shale would be organic rich, so it would form a source rock and a seal. Then there'd be another layer of uh, limestone deposited and then another layer of mudstone. And then finally, after all of this was deposited, the rocks were folded and then the oil and gas were generated. So as a result, Saudi has around 65 years of oil left at its current production, which is 11 million barrels a day. So around 15, uh, around 11% of the world's production daily. And overall, the world has around 46 years left, a current consumption of oil that has already been found. So if we were to go on just not looking for any new oil, just producing what we have, we'd have about 46 years left before all of that oil was used up. And then I felt I should mention this. It's a, it's a very minor element, but uh, there, there are some scientists who believe in abiotic oil, so oil that was not generated from bugs. And uh, this gentleman, Thomas Gold, about 100 years ago, he suggested that oil bubbled up from the Earth's crust. And so they drilled a bunch of granite bosses and uh, other igneous rocks, and they didn't really find any. And then they, they drilled in this ring structure here in Sweden, and uh, they, they were able to find some hydrocarbons, not a great deal, but 15 tons of oily sludge. But actually what we think is that this was probably an impact crater and was very fractured. And maybe there were some source rocks around that actually generated the hydrocarbons that they found in here. But overall, there are a few uh, igneous rocks that are producing hydrocarbons, but very little evidence that they're being produced without having those planktonic foraminifera and the diatoms to actually generate the oil. So I'm just going to finish off here with a few crazy stories from the oil and gas industry, and we'll come back to this gentleman in a moment. So first of all, I mentioned meteor craters, and there there are they actually make fantastic oil fields. You wouldn't think it, but basically you blast a huge hole into the earth. It fills up with reservoir rocks and source rocks, and then you start depositing deep, deep marine shales over the top of it to act as a seal. So as I said, 37 oil fields in craters around the world, and we only know of about 250 craters. So that's about a 25% success rate, which is much higher than we get from many other plays. And one example of a field is the Cantarell field in Mexico. And this is formed by the meteor impact that sadly wiped out the dinosaurs. And at the peak production, it was producing 2 million barrels a day. So this is sitting down on the north coast of Mexico. This is what it looks like in a in seismic view. So this is once again using the sound waves that you pump down into the subsurface. You can see the crater beautifully preserved there. And uh, yeah, 35 billion barrels of oil in that one field, thanks to that dinosaur killer. Next story I have for you is from uh, Iran and uh, from the Com formation in Iran. So uh, what they were doing, they, they found this structure here. They could see the structure on seismic where they had this beautiful anticlinal feature here, and they had a good idea that there was going to be oil underneath. So they tried drilling down through this very thick salt layer, but the salt layer was 380 meters thick. And most of the time when they were drilling down, they'd drill down and then unfortunately, something would happen with the drill bit, it would get stuck in these very mobile salts, and you'd end up losing the whole well. So anyway, on the fifth go, the fifth well, Al Wars 5 well, they um, managed to get through the salt and they hit the reservoir and they drilled five centimeters or two inches into the reservoir. And the reservoir was incredibly highly pressured. And it blew out, it destroyed the drilling rig, 
they close the blowout preventer which is a structure that you can kind of like scissor onto the the drill bore to close it off but the fluid pressures were so high they tore out the whole packer system and they actually fired the 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 um drill string up into the air so you had this metal drill string that they were using to drill down into the subsurface and it blew it out up into the sky and uh the well was capped but the blowout continued for about three months and this picture here on the right hand side is not a lake it is a lake of oil that was generated so five million barrels of oil spilled out onto the landscape and they actually collected this oil up and then managed to pump it back and use it as oil at the end of the day so the next story is the equivalent for gas so you might think to yourself well oil yeah that could be really problem but uh, gas is fine so this is the Slian gas blowout in the Netherlands in 1965 and they were drilling down and they also hit a very highly pressured reservoir and the gas came out of the reservoir and basically fluidized this whole area here so this is a sort of fluidized crater and there's supposed to be a drilling rig in the middle here this was the drilling rig while they were busy drilling but the drilling rig basically went down into the subsurface and has never been seen again and it also released a huge amount of natural gas and the site is still leaking methane so you're not allowed to go into the site now and visit because there's still methane that's being generated and coming up to surface next we're going to talk about the Sleipner A platform so this was a, a platform that was built with this design in mind so the idea was that they were going to have this oil platform at surface and they'd have these bulbous concrete structures beneath the 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 sea sea uh, surface here and they would be filled with air and that would provide the buoyancy that the structure needed so this is what it looked like when it was being built and the idea was that all of these would be air filled and these are the legs of the platform here in this this upper right hand diagram and unfortunately they, they did a, a had some problems with the concrete codes and they did a incorrect finite element analysis modeling of this whole structure so they were busy towing this structure out into the fjord and uh they were planning to lower it into the water and then as as it was lowered into the water just to be towed out they heard some rumbling noises and the water began pouring into these cells and each of the cell walls failed one by one and the structure sank to the bottom of the fjord and actually created a small earthquake when it landed on the fjord floor no one was injured uh, despite the earthquake and the, the whole structure is still there unfortunately the fjord is deep enough that the the other boats and things like that can still pass over the top of this uh, this Sleipner platform so our next story is from Lake Penoir in Louisiana and uh, it's become a record holder so this was a beautiful freshwater lake covering about 1300 acres and uh, Texaco came along to this area and they started drilling for oil they're actually in the lake and they were planning to drill over here in the and this in this lower left hand diagram and the bit seized up when they got to about four, 400 meters depth and they were trying to shake it up and down and free it and they heard a series of pops and at that moment the platform and the oil derrick overturned and disappeared and that all of the people who were on the the oil rig managed to get away a whirlpool began to form this is a picture of the whirlpool that formed and what they'd done is that they they incorrectly um that the coordinates were the wrong way around for the well so they thought they were drilling in this point here and they were actually drilling somewhere closer to this salt mine that was sitting beneath the lake and uh it they hauled into the salt mine it dissolved all the salt there were 55 workers in the mine but they all managed to escape they had these safety doors that they closed and that whirlpool eventually swallowed two drilling platforms 11 barges a parking lot 65 acres of terrain there was also a garden center and hundreds of trees and they all went down this whirlpool and into the salt mine and as a result they create they turned the freshwater lake into a salt lake and the salt lake actually that originally the the water was flowing into this lake from a river but there, there'd been so much disturbance that eventually the the river changed course and reversed itself and started coming into the lake rather than out of it and created a world the biggest waterfall in Louisiana as a result so uh, huge things series of uh, events that were all caused by just two coordinates swapped around and the last one we're going to talk about here is the 
the gateway to hell in Turkmenistan. So this was originally drilled for oil in 1971, and it collapsed to form this crater here, the Dabaza crater. And uh, the Russian scientists who were associated with this project just decided it would be a good idea to light the methane that was leaking out of this crater, and it's burned ever since. And apparently the Turkmenistan government ordered it to be stifled in 2010, but no action's yet been taken. And the Explorers Club of New York, who fancy themselves as the daredevils, they sent this guy in who's in this silver suit, and he is collecting samples here to see whether there's extremophile bacteria that are surviving down here in the crater. And it, I can safely say that this was 99% a publicity stunt, and I'm not sure whether they actually even got any results at the end of the day. So just to finish off, we now know oil and gas are formed by plankton and plants, not by dinosaurs. You need a combination of play elements to make a successful oil or gas field, source, reservoir, seal and trap. And there's no big caves of oil under, underground waiting to be drilled into. You need the kerogen and you need it to be buried at depth and heated up and matured to make oil and gas. And at the current rate, there's at least 46 years worth of oil already discovered and producible that can continue to meet world demand at current rates. And I can safely say that by 2050, I don't think that the, produ the oil production and the oil usage is going to be significantly different to what it is today. Despite all of the requirements from global warming to try and cut down usage, I, I think just people that the, the, the slow to react and slow to do anything about it. So I think we're still going to see a lot of uh, petrol fueled vehicles in the future. So in 19 in 2022, 14 percent of new cars sold were electric, but that was really dominated by three countries. So China, Europe and the USA. So overall, I think that for now, at least hydrocarbons are going to be with us for quite a while. So thank you very much. So with that, I'm Put my email down here that if anyone's got any questions they want to submit to me by email and uh, otherwise i'm happy to take any questions thank you very much thanks so much john um just looking through the q a here we've had some good questions i'm gonna i'm gonna take two questions from um andrea and kind of combine them together and expand on them so sorry andrea uh she's she just wants to clarify the times you've said things like we take carriages and bury them deep enough we're not literally taking carriage and material and bearing it. This is just figure of speech. Yes, figure of speech. So, so basically geological activity, things happen glacially slow. You know, they happen very, very slowly. But <laughs> over time, you will deposit rocks at about four centimeters every thousand years. So that's about the speed that you deposit these, these reservoirs and these seal rocks at. And then very, very gradually, those will be buried. And uh, so the mountain building and activities like that will speed up the process slightly. But to bury rocks is literally does take millions of years. So no, we we are not doing that. There's been considerations at times when they thought oil was running out. There was discussion about is there a way that we can help that generation process? But no, you're absolutely right. It's a it's a geological process. It's not like humans are taking these uh, the kerogen and burying it and then hoping it heats up. Mm -hmm. And she and Ron are asking sort of more, bringing lots of related questions uh, in here. Um, do we do we sort of track uh, potential source rocks to mark for future generations where oil might be produced, and and how well can we accurately predict, uh, you know, whether currently existing swamps and oceans will someday produce these kinds of hydrocarbons down the line? Yeah, so I I think the geological timescale for the for the swamps that we have right now, there there is. Uh, very little chance that there'll be anything that will happen to them for millions of years but there are rocks out there and source rocks out there that we know about and the probably the best example is the green river shale which covers about a, a third of colorado utah and wyoming you have this enormous area of oil shales which we can't do anything with because we can't produce them right now so the oil is in there but we have no way of getting the oil out of the shales at economically so it can be done so we that is marked up as something that people have tried very very hard to get the oil out of and one day if it gets to the stage where we still need oil and there's no oil left maybe there'll be some antique car enthusiasts who are desperate to have petroleum after the petroleum's run out everywhere then we might find a way of getting the oil out of those very very difficult to access source rocks so yes there's lots of areas around the world where we've found oil and gas that are not producible, not economic, 
So they're just waiting there for when times change. Can you speak anything to uh, to synthetic and artificially produced oil and gasoline? Because I know that's that's something that sort of comes and goes as a topic of discussion depending on availability and price. Yeah, I, I don't know a great deal about synthetic oil and gas, but I, I do know that they are way more expensive than anything that you can get out of the, the earth. So right now, uh, a barrel of oil is selling for about $93 a barrel, something like that. That's today's price. Mm -hmm. So the price of producing oil from the subsurface in Saudi Arabia is sitting at about $4.50. So if you do the math, for every $4.50 that you spend, you're getting $89 back just by drilling holes. So yeah, there's no real need to produce oil synthetically as yet. And I mean, a lot of places are very jealous of the, the Saudis and the Irans and Iraqs because they do have these enormous oil and gas reserves. I mean, the biggest oil field in the world is in Saudi Arabia, the Gawar field. It's also the 15th biggest gas field in the world. So they have really everything that they need. So I think what we'll do is in the future, we, we're going to be beholden to the Middle East to a greater extent than we are now. But uh, I, I don't see that, that there's going to be much need for synthetic oil for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, Clark's asking about uh, tar pits. He's setting the, the La Brea ones in California. Are they an example of one of those places where there's hydrocarbons present, but they're not sufficiently retained underground? Yes, yes, they are. And what's interesting is that if you have the access to surface, so if you have a, a, a reservoir where there's oil accumulating, but it has an outlet to surface, what happens is that the, the bugs, bacteria will get into your reservoir and they'll start eating your oil and they'll start degrading it. So the reason why the oil sands are full of bitumen and tar and are not full of oil is that the bugs have gone in and have eaten all the light stuff. So they off, when you're working in the offshore, if you're working in an oil field offshore and you're having trouble producing your oil, then one of the ways that you can increase the production is what's called EOR, enhanced oil recovery, where you pump water into your reservoir and it drives out the oil because the oil floats on top of the water. So the oil is pushed out. But if you don't bake, basically steam your water first and, and boil your water first, if you leave the bugs in there, you introduce the bugs into your reservoir in the subsurface and they start eating all your oil and you can lit, almost watch your oil being degraded by the bugs that you introduce. So most of the times when you see these things like La Brea tar pits, like the oil sands, Venezuela's oil sands, what's happened is that the bugs have got in there because they're just too near to surface. Is there, going off of that, is there sort of a regular use of, of bacteria as a way to, say, clean up oil spills or convert spills of, of these kinds of chemicals into a more manageable form if they're that enthusiastic about, about consuming these, these chemicals? Uh, I, so I know, I, know that's, I know that there's been research into that. And in fact, I was involved in a little project where we had a blue sky day where we had to think of ideas when I was at Shell. And that was one of the ideas we came up with was to use the bacteria in some way. I don't think it's proved economic as yet. And that's another one of those things that, you know, if the oil reserves start reducing dramatically and there's not much oil left and it's still required and we haven't got away from using oil, then I think, think ideas like that will definitely come to the forefront. But right now, I think several big oil companies have looked at it, but it hasn't really been proven economic as yet. Hmm. Uh, Clark's also asking, you'd mentioned um, the, the phrase recovery factors, talking about sort of a 30% recovery factor for, for hydrocarbons taken from a, from a site. What, what happens to the remaining 70%? Is that lost? Is that unusable? Uh, so that the, remaining, the remainder of it is stuck underground. So okay. the, the very highest figures of all, it's much easier to produce gas than it is to produce oil because it's smaller molecules. So they can wiggle their way through smaller gaps in the rock. So typical um, gas recovery factors can be up to about 90%, whereas uh, oil yeah, is typically between 10% for limestones and about 30 to 40% for sandstones. But the rest of it is literally just stuck there underground. And I just wanted to tell a little story about a gas field in Indonesia I worked on. So it was, there were all these bugs down there, these shelled bugs that were down there on, in the subsurface. So it was a limestone that was full of these little foraminifera, these little shelled animals. And they were, each one of them was full of uh, gas. So the actual porosity of that rock was about 62%, which is huge. So 62% of the rock was a void filled with gas. 
So an oil company came along, an oil and gas company, they drilled into this, this structure, which was actually, it was capped by an island at the top, and they drilled down and they started producing the gas. And as they produced the gas, the island started sinking because all of that pore space was being removed. So as they sucked the gas out, the island went down and the, the islanders actually had to be moved to another island because the island that was sitting above this reservoir just disappeared. Oh my goodness. Wow. Um, earlier, you'd mentioned this idea of, uh, in the realm of natural gas, of wet and dry gas. Can you explain that distinction a bit? Uh, it's it's really just a, a combination of the, the um, carbon and hydrocarbon. So hydrocarbon is basically a mixture of hydrogen and carbon, obviously. So the simplest structures are CH4. So that's a carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms attached. And that is methane. So that is, it, it's known as a dry gas. And that's the simplest form of gas you can get. And then as you go further, and as you add more carbon atoms, and therefore are able to have more hydrogen atoms as well. So then you get something like C5H28 or something like that. So you have all of these combinations of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, which are heavier molecules, because they've got more molecules involved with them. And that certainly the, the lighter ones of those are known as the wet gases. So that it, and I don't believe that they're actually wet. But, and then as you carry on and you get into the heavier elements, you go into condensate. So it's like a, a, a liquid gas that forms. And that actually can make a gas reservoir very, very um, profitable. Because if you have this condensate that's associated with the gas, so it's it's much lighter than oil. Oil oil is much heavier and thicker. thicker. So this is very, very light oil indeed. It's, it's, it's the kind of oil that you, if you shake around the gas canister, you can hear that oil inside. And uh, that that's very very um, profitable. So it's it's worth as much as a, a barrel of oil, a barrel of condensate. Are there ever situations in, in extraction where you get, I guess, the, the, I don't know the terminology, but sort of incompletely or only partially formed oil reservoirs where you're dealing with sort of a, maybe there's sort of a sediment still left in it or, or organic material that can't be processed that's left behind? How does that work? Yeah, so there's uh, there's lot, lots of problems when you're trying to produce your reservoir, and they can be caused by wax that's associated with the oil. So wax is another hydrocarbon, and uh, there are there are oil and oil fields fields that produce that you can literally skim off the wax from the top. But sometimes that wax, particularly if you have cold environments, and we we're specialized in that in Canada, so we've got areas where it gets down to minus forty degrees C. And the wax, as the oil comes out of the ground, the wax just solidifies and just stops the oil being produced. And then another problem that you can have is if you have a reservoir, a sandstone reservoir, that's not very well cemented. So it's not very consolidated and it's almost still friable and still a sand. And that sand can block up your entire well bore. So in that case, what, what you can do is you can put screens around your well. So basically you drill down, so you have your drill pipe. You blast holes in it so that the oil can get in, but then you make sure that you have a kind of wire mesh around those holes to try and a very fine wire mesh that stops the sand from choking off your, your um, drill bore. Tom's asked a great question that, that may be a complicated enough question. We need to follow up with it by email, but um, he's asking, can you, can you give us sort of a, because it, it's an issue or a, a technology that's very familiar to lots of Canadians, but maybe not very well understood by lots of Canadians. Can you give us a brief outline of, of fracking and the, the basics of how it works? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so what happens is that uh, you have a reservoir in the subsurface that has oil in it, but it's actually a source rock rather than a reservoir. So you have this beautiful, very oily rock, but you, but it hasn't got enough pore space and enough permeability pathways for the oil to get out. So you basically drill a hole into it and then you pump water down at about 15,000 pounds per square inch. And that water pushes its way out and fractures the rock as it goes. And what they'll do is they'll drill three or four holes into a, res into a reservoir, into this, this basically source rock, and they'll put listening stations. So they'll have seismic um, cones just in down in the well bore that are listening and you can hear the fractures happening. And if you have three wells, all of with all listening, all monitoring that those fractures, you can triangulate in so you can see where the fractures are propagating through the rock. 
So anyway, when you have those fractures, the, the water that you pump down, you don't just have water, you put some grains inside it. So they might be ceramic little balls, or you can use a very strong sand, sand grains, and you put them in it so that when you open up those fractures, the sand grains go into the fractures as well, and, and they hold the fracture open. So when you take the pressure away, instead of everything just closing back up again, you've got all of these little balls in there that are holding all of those fractures open. And a typical fracking job will be, a, let's say, 90 meters vertically and extend for, a, for about two or 300 meters to up to a kilometer away from the wellbore. So one of the ways that you can make that process work better is if you drill a horizontal well, so you have a well that goes for two kilometers horizontally, you can block off bits of the well one by one and frack each of those sections. So you'll end up with a set of fractures at the end of the well and a set of fractures a bit nearer the well, set of fractures close to the well. And that means that you can get fracture coverage throughout your reservoir. And what they do is they use balls so, so that, uh, that they'll drill that well bore all the way horizontally. And then they'll have these slots that they put in that, that they have little ball, almost like ball bearings that they'll put them through and they'll get stuck where the hole is and they'll block the hole. And then that will contain the fracture within one part of the reservoir. And I know it's a fairly controversial technique. Is it, are there, is there sort of a, a true or a false perception of its risks and, and how, much is it used internationally at the moment? I know there was lots of talk about banning the idea of fracking, but but to what degree and why? Okay, so first of all, it's it's not dangerous. So that when when the fracking is going on, the fracking is always done underneath a massive seal. So the frack cannot get through the seal and get up to surface. So the idea is that you'll frack your reservoir rocks deep in the earth's surface, but you will not introduce oil into shallow groundwater. So typically fracking never starts until you're at least a kilometer below the surface. So it's not going to interfere. Where the problems come from and where the, all of these earthquakes that people talk about is with water injection. So after you've got this waste water left over that's come been down and come back out again, so the water is produced back out of the well, then they try and inject that water and it's the injecting the water afterwards into shallower rocks that causes the earthquakes and causes the problems. So something like, 3% of the frac of the earthquakes are caused by fracking or even, maybe even less and the rest of it is all by water injection so that that's really where the problems lie so if you if you handle your fracking job sensibly you should never have a problem and there should be no impact on the environment whatsoever how are we doing for time alex and who are coming up I on think, eight? i think we are 2 minutes over so let's uh hold ourselves accountable this evening. Uh, thank you so much, John. And if anyone has any questions um, about, about any of this, I know it was quite a, an in-depth conversation, a little bit outside of our normal area of expertise in, in Canadian automobiles, but still very relevant, very Canadian. Um, things like fracking, uh, the oil sands, all these things are, are part and parcel of, of the automobile uh, in Canada and, and the world uh, for the next 50 years, we see. So it's good to know uh, all the ins and outs. We're also working on talks. Uh, Demeric and I have been talking about uh, finding battery experts. There's a lot of talk about batteries as well. Uh, so we'll hopefully have a speaker on that soon. Uh, so John, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're more than welcome to come to the museum anytime when you're in Ontario. We'd love to show you around. Fantastic. Um, and anything you'd like to say before we wrap up? Oh, just thanks everybody for coming. This is last picture here is a picture of Moraine Lake. So it's about hour and a half's drive from Calgary and beautiful scenery, but those rocks in the foreground there, those are the rocks that they're using for carbon sequestration. So it's the Gog Quartzite, it's a Cambrian Quartzite, so about 550 million years old. And in the subsurface, those same rocks occur and they're drilling down and pumping carbon, liquid carbon dioxide into those reservoirs to help to reduce the impact of global warming.